Okay, um, Eric, that was awesome. Uh, that's a hard act to follow. And uh, uh, Derek, thank you for inviting me. And uh, thank you to the uh, COA uh, team uh, for setting this up. Um, my name is Gavin Pereira. I am at UC Davis. I'm an associate professor of orthopedics. Um, and unlike Derek, um, I only have 50% uh, of my practice is uh, revisions and complex cases. These are my disclosures. And uh, there's a couple of slides that I think you should take some screenshots or take photographs of the slides because I won't have time to go through uh, it individually. So um, most of us are here because we do hip replacements because they're so successful. And, um, but sometimes they don't work and patients are not happy and we feel bad about it. And we are obliged to make them better. So, um, there are many tips and, tips and tricks of doing hip replacements. Um, I'd like to share some of the ones that I've learned over the years, mostly from making mistakes myself, uh, some that I've learned from my revision practice and some that I learned from uh, seeing rest and struggle. Um, what I won't be talking about are the pros and cons of any particular approach or implants and not much about the new hip and spine relationship uh, philosophies. So what are we trying to prevent? We're trying to prevent loosening, dislocations, periprosthetic fractures, leg length discrepancies, and uh, uh, things like that. And uh, what I'd like to talk about are certain aspects of the whole spectrum of how to do a hip replacement. It's not something that I can cover uh, today, but um, we'll hit the main points. This is what I tend to teach my residents about pre-op checks. I call it the five C's. Um, I make sure that I check the indication because sometimes the pain has changed. Sometimes a different uh, joint has become involved now um, or um, the implant might need to be changed. I check clearances. I need to make sure what the, uh, um, the cardiologist has said about the anticoagulation, for example. Um, I check the skin to make sure that the, there are no rashes and no open wounds. And I check circulation and sensation. Um, and have to document it. Anyone with a spine issue, for example, who may have a residual um, foot drop, it is important to document that preoperatively so that you're not surprised postoperatively. And of course, you then can send the patient uh, appropriately. One of the things I always uh, tell the patient about, which uh, we never thought, is to tell them that it is very likely that their operated leg might be longer or feel longer for a while after the surgery. You don't want the physical therapist telling them that or oh, they will get sensitized to it. Um, templating is very near and dear to my heart. I template every patient uh, because it focuses my mind. Uh, it brings to mind um, the kind of bone that you might be seeing. Um, it brings to mind the size of the bones. This patient is a 17 year old girl with uh, TB of her hip. And until I templated the hip, I didn't realize that the cup size was only about 40 and the stem was extremely small. And um, we had to especially order the stem size. This patient looked pretty straightforward until he stood up and he had the, this giant wingspan. Uh, and when I templated him, his offset was nearly 70 millimeters, which far exceeds any of the um, um, implants that we have. And I had to then postpone his operation and uh, order a custom implant. Uh, other deformities that I like to um, pay attention to are various necks, uh, because these can be difficult to balance, uh, and protrusia. Uh, you do not want to end up with uh, this kind of a patient who everything looks good, um, but because of the reduced offset, um, he is miserable. There are three main steps, I think, to templating, um, but I've broken them down further into 10 steps. Uh, the three main steps are you address the cup, the leg length discrepancy, and then the stem. So let's go to the 10 steps uh, uh, here. The first thing to do is to uh, get a radio peg marker. <clears throat> the x-rays have to have a radio peg marker to calibrate them, whether you are doing it uh, digitally or with uh, acetate templates. Um, it is important that the radio peg marker is in the same coronal plane as the hips, and you should get a low AP pelvis with no rotation. 
I typically tend to use either uh, a metal ball, uh, which I bought from Amazon, uh, which is one inch in diameter, or you can just use a quarter that you stick to the, uh, to the medial side of the thigh, um, um, dropping it into a, into a glove. It's important to get um, a good view of the uh, hip joints as well as the proximal femurs. Um, I want to be able to see the calcar cortex uh, and the lesser trochanter hiding behind it. Um, I want to be able to see good, uh, a good view of the pelvis. And um, uh, an x-ray like this is not really adequate because uh, you cannot see the proximal femurs. Um, an x-ray like this is not really appropriate for uh, templating, but has to be accepted because the patient may not be able to internally rotate their, uh, their limbs because of the stiffness in the hip. But you have to be aware of this. Uh, if you see the lesser trochanter more easily, it's likely that the uh, leg is externally rotated and the neck may appear shorter than it is and it may appear more valgus than it is. The next step is to calibrate the image. Most digital softwares will do that automatically, um, but you should be aware of how, uh, you, most PAC software will allow you to calibrate uh, a radio opaque marker as well. The next step is to, uh, is to size the head. I, I like to size, I like to use the cup uh, template to size the head because I'll use this intraoperatively to validate the templating. And once I measure the head size, this is a surrogate of the AP diameter of the acetabulum, and therefore helps me uh, not overream uh, the acetabulum and blow the anti and posterior walls off. So once I measure the head size, I add four and, a, and six millimeters to it, and I get two numbers. And these are the most likely cup sizes uh, that I will um, uh, find intraoperatively, provided the calibration is close. The next step is to establish the hip center. So I then move the cup, the templated cup, medially up to the ischial line and uh, inferiorly up to the, uh, just past the teardrop. Um, once I do that, I confirm the inclination and now I have bought the, the hip center and the position of the cup. And uh, this is what I try to, um, uh, to execute in, intraoperatively. The next step is to measure the leg length discrepancy. And this is to give you a target leg length, uh, leg length after the surgery. And uh, there are different methods of measuring leg length, but you have to find an appropriate uh, landmark on either side of the pelvis and an appropriate landmark on either femur, on both femurs that you can see clearly. And you can use different lines. You can use a line uh, at the bottom of the uh, uh, ischial uh, tuberosities a line at the bottom of the foramen uh, or through the teardrops. Um, you can use the corner of the lesser trochanter, the apex of the lesser trochanter, or the tip of the GT. Once you know the leg length discrepancy, we go to the size uh, sizing of the stem. And I use the Goldilocks test. Um, I try a small stem. I go, this is too small. Um, and I look at, I go up a few sizes and I go up to uh, uh, an extra large stem and I go, this is too, lot, too big. And then I find the sweet spot where I see just a little bit of sunlight between the uh, implant template and the cortex. And I know that this uh, stem is uh, appropriately sized for this calibrated image. And I want to see, be able to see that the calcar of the implant matches the calcar of the uh, femur. The next two steps establish the offset of the, of the patient. And uh, that is to do with the neck angle uh, and the neck length. So to determine the neck angle, um, most implants will have uh, a standard stem and a coxavera stem. And uh, once, uh, and I think you have to try both to see which one will allow you to choose uh, uh, the best offset and leg length for the patient. The next step would be to determine the neck length. Um, and the neck length is inversely proportionate to the depth of the bore of the head. So the, the deeper the bore, uh, the shorter the neck length. And um, uh, again, we do a Goldilocks test to see which is the best uh, neck length uh, to allow you to restore the uh, offset. And finally, I measured two, two distances, what I was taught to call the LT-HC distance and the NC-HC distance. 
the LT Etsy distance is the distance from the lesser trochanter to the hip center. And the NC Etsy distance is the neck cut to the hip center distance. These are the numbers that will hang in my OR um, on the screen. And these are something that I will try and reproduce uh, intraoperatively. And I can do this both by a posterior approach as well as with an anterior approach because um, these would be a surrogate of the leg length and offset. So in summary, the templating uh, gives you your cup size, your stem size, and you need to restore your leg length and offset. Okay, moving on. Uh, some of the tricks uh, with the posterior approach, I like to make sure that uh, my hip, my operative hip can flex uh, at least to 90 degrees, if not more, um, and that the pelvic positioner is not impeding the flexion of the hip. I also like to make sure that the space in front of the uh, down leg is, is empty because uh, this is uh, really important during the flexion adduction and internal rotation maneuver while addressing the femur because you want to clear shot down the femur and if this hip the down hip is uh, is flexed uh, too much and the knee uh, the the contralateral knee impedes this flexion and adduction um, you are really struggling and fighting the soft tissues uh, to address the uh, the femur uh, this is just another couple of views of the same thing um, a couple of points about uh, retractors that are teaser residents. When putting the anterior retractor uh, over the anterior wall, uh, try and avoid the three o'clock position, and it should really go somewhere between the two o'clock and the 12 o'clock position. Um, with retractors that go deep to the uh, TAL, I would uh, teach my residents not to go anteriorly, but to go more posteriorly because there's the uh, acetabular branch of the obturator artery and nerve and the obturator nerve and artery itself are actually very close by. <clears throat> um, some of the tricks with the anterior approach, um, I like to keep my, uh, my hips slightly flexed, both because of the fixed flexion deformity that inadvertently happens, um, but also because it detensions the psoas. And I find uh, that retracting it out of the way um, is easier with the hips uh, flexed. Um, I also use a shower curtain uh, for my drapes uh, with a blue towel over the perineal post. Um, the reason for the shower curtain is that I can see the limb quite clearly and um, uh, I can also see the limb uh, to make sure that it's not uh, coming off the boot when dropping the spar. I also like to look at, be able to look at the toes so they're not turning purple, uh, things like that. Here's a trick that I learned from a view medi. Unfortunately, that video was taken down for some reason, but I found that it was really quite useful. Uh, this is during the anterior approach. Uh, before I make my capsulotomy, I create this potential space and um, I create a space that is actually a potential space between the gluteus medius tendon and the greater trochanter. Um, I put a uh, a homen in there and uh, um, release the soft tissues, uh, which uh, are nothing really, but this allows the uh, superior capsule to be identified. And then when I finally uh, do my capsulotomy, I'm making my release right about here, which actually helps um, later on uh, while addressing the femur. I also teach my residents to make what is called a metal hammock. Uh, this protects the posterior structures when using the saw. I also teach my residents to do just an anterior cut in the cortex of the neck first, uh, then proceed distally, complete the distal calcar cut, and then come back uh, proximally and bounce the uh, saw blade uh, very, very carefully and slowly, because if you plunge, uh, you may damage the posterior uh, greater trochanter, but also uh, you may damage the ascending branch of the uh, uh, medial circumflex, which, is, uh, which can bleed a lot. <clears throat> Another trick that I had to teach myself was I used to put the uh, anterior retractor underneath the psoas tendon, but after I had a few patients that uh, had uh, psoas tendonitis, I started uh, putting the, uh, the retractor between the capsule and the labrum, and it actually gives a pretty good view of the, uh, of the labrum to excise it and also be able to see the anterior rim um, when I'm putting my uh, cup in. 
Um, I also found that releasing the capsule uh, on the medial side all the way down to be able to feel or see the lesser trochanter right at the beginning um, helps move the femur away from the acetabulum and gives a better view of the acetabulum. Um, when addressing the uh, femur, um, I uh, teach my residents to put the, the retractor more posteriorly and not anteriorly uh, to support the, uh, the bulk of the trochanter uh, to prevent uh, fractures. A couple of words about acetabular sizing. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, as I excise the femoral head, the first thing I do is I measure the, hem the diameter of the femoral head. Uh, this does a couple of things. One is that it validates my templating. Uh, and if I find that I've undersized or oversized uh, my templating, then I know that my implants may actually be slightly off. But I add four millimeters and six millimeters to the size of the femoral head that I measured. And this gives me an estimate of what the final reamer and possibly the cup's gonna be. And this is very important because if, as I, as I approach that number, that size of the acetabular reamer, I want to make sure that I'm getting my chatter and my kickback that I feel. Uh, and if it isn't, then that means that something is wrong. In terms of Positioning the acetabular cup, this can be done either with a posterior approach or an anterior approach or any other approach. I tend to use the TAL as part of my uh, checks. Um, the uh, inferior rim of the acetabular cup or rima should be uh, slightly anteverted to the uh, TAL, and I like to see a slight V sign uh, right here. Um, this would indicate that this, is, this cup is neutral, and this would indicate that the cup is retroverted. But I also like to make sure that the anterior rim of the cup is just uh, uh, deep to the anterior wall of the acetabulum. Some of the tricks on the femoral side, uh, this is something that I was taught in fellowship. Um, when, I, when doing the posterior approach, uh, before I uh, excise the head, I would drill a hole or make a bovi mark right here at the neck, um, uh, lesser trochanter uh, corner, and measure this distance from the lesser trochanter to the hip center. The, uh, imagine an equator around the head here and the center of that equator. And I use a paper ruler that comes with a skin marker to measure this distance. This distance should be very similar to the templated uh, LTHC distance. And this is again, another validation uh, step uh, for my templating. Uh, irrespective, I, I like to use this to, uh, to uh, reconstruct my leg length and offset. And this picture just shows um, uh, what that actually means. Um, some of the tips uh, for avoiding uh, various, as you know, uh, using uncemented stems, um, various positioning is not that critical, but um, what I really want to talk about is that if the uh, stem is in too much of varus, it can be undersized and then later subside, or it can end up uh, causing a, a fracture intraoperatively. And I want to bring your attention to this uh, particular area of the bone, which I call the NGT uh, junction, which is the neck greater trochanter junction. There's a sclerotic bar of bone right here that can prevent the stem from, uh, from entering into the, uh, into the femoral canal. Uh, this is another uh, picture showing exactly uh, what this means. And so it is important to excise uh, this um, um, uh, bar of bone to allow better seating of the implant. Talking of calcar fractures, if this does happen, um, the, um, uh, the established wisdom is that you remove the implant, uh, apply a cable around the proximal uh, femur, um, uh, avoiding uh, catching the psoas tendon, and then reinsert the same implant. A uh, quick um, uh, reminder about cementing. I cement uh, implants um, when uh, the patient is osteoporotic. Uh, if they have radiated bone, or if um, I find that after I've um, uh, tried uh, my trial implant and I'm not getting the right stability, I might decide to cement. And of course, if you're doing somebody uh, such as uh, a multiple myeloma patient, uh, you might want to uh, cement uh, as well. Um, 
I won't go into details here, but one of my residents, uh, Dr. Padada, uh, came up with this uh, matrix after I did a lecture on templating. And uh, this is uh, something that I'd like you to either take a screenshot or take a photograph of, but I won't go into details. This is very similar to the uh, sagittal balancing of the knee, and we're in the process of trying to write uh, uh, a paper about it. And this is the same thing um, uh, for cemented uh, hips as well. In terms of new technologies uh, that are present and uh, in the future, uh, we mentioned robotics with knees. Uh, robotics are here for hips as well, patient-specific jigs and uh, uh, Altaian hip and knee, uh, hip, hip and spine uh, relationship as well. To me, the robotics, uh, um, uh, the, the, the promise of robotics is this uh, process wherein you can do a preoperative plan uh, before you uh, work on the patient. You then validate um, and check the integration integrity of your plan during surgery, and then you execute that plan with the robot is meant to do very precisely. That's the whole philosophy of why robots um, may be uh, the um, uh, established technique in the future. You can choose the position of the implant preoperatively, pre either on a CT scan or plane images. You can even um, position the femoral stem uh, at where you want it to be and check for leg length and offset, uh, et cetera. And um, some systems even allow you to see what the post of X-ray may look like um, 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 uh, after the surgery. Uh, they are bulky, uh, they're getting smaller, um, they are expensive, and um, uh, I think uh, uh, they are probably here to stay. <clears throat> um, in terms of uh, other technologies, uh, there, there are available technologies that will allow you to choose the position of the cup uh, that is specific to the patient. Um, taking into consideration the uh, position of the pelvis in the, with the patient sitting and standing and uh, uh, stair climbing. And uh, the company can make um, uh, 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 patient specific jigs to allow you to choose uh, the correct position or, or quote unquote the correct position. Um, and uh, this particular company has lasers that allow you to uh, position the uh, reamer and the cup position. I won't go into hip spine relationship, but for those interested, I would um, highly recommend uh, this view medi. Although it is a year old, I think it's a very clear, um, it gives you a very clear and succinct uh, idea of hip spine relationship. So for those not, not aware of this, this is, uh, this is big and this is current, and uh, this is going to make a big difference in the future. On that note, I will stop. Awesome, Gavin, thank you. That was again, uh whirlwind tour through total hip arthroplasty. I, I, I would say I really appreciate your focus on lateral offset reconstruction. That kind of is a hidden gem of hip reconstruction and hip balancing. Um, maybe we can go back to assistive technologies and hip spine relationship and kind of this cup anxiety that's been induced in everybody. Um, so you may, there may be some people who are interested in your use of dual mobility, uh, how much you're taking into account spine pathology and for which patients, uh, because they do develop it over time. So comment specifically on that, and then uh, we'll get in, maybe get into some more details, but we only have three minutes, so quickly. Yes, uh, very quickly. Um, so at the moment, we are still evaluating um, how we preoperatively plan um, patients that might have a, um, a spine pathology. We are now getting lateral x-rays of, uh, uh, of the hip and uh, spine in sitting and standing. And we're trying to evaluate, um, uh, you know, where we go from here. Um, but uh, generally speaking, if I see somebody who has a very stiff uh, spine, um, if I see somebody who has uh, uh, fusion rods and especially screws that go down into the uh, into the pelvis, um, I am thinking um, um, very loudly in my head about putting in a dual mobility and maybe even having a constraint option. Um, so I have a lower threshold now to do a dual mobility uh, for patients that have a stiff spine or I see them uh, with a fusion in their spine. Yeah. One, one trick I've found here is that I'll trial with one lower. So 
In most patients, I'll trial utilizing a 32 and then maybe use a 36. And if you can't make a 36 stable, increasing head size, you need large amounts of increasing head size to create stability. And then the other thing here hidden is that component impingement won't, dual mobility won't save you from component impingement. So trialing becomes one of the most critical components here. Comment a little bit on kind of also approach anxiety. So how much is and what are the indications and maybe some of the complications between approaches for people considering switching versus um, kind of validating what they do? Yeah, we can go on. We can we can talk about this forever. Um, and uh, but I'll 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 put it short. And this is what I tell patients, especially when they come seeking me for anti approaches. Um, I tell them that uh, at the end of the day, at three months, and certainly at a year, most patients are exactly the same. Um, the perception of uh, the direct anti approach um, is that you recover faster, mainly because we don't allow them to. Um, uh, we we allow them. Um, we don't restrict them uh, into flexion. And my physical therapist had taught me this, that you know everything that we do is with flexion. Um, but I think um, for those who uh, are established in the way they do their procedures, um, sticking to it is most important. And uh, knowing what you know is, um, is the best for the patient. Um, uh, changing approaches, uh, does require a very steep learning curve and very long learning curve, um, especially with the anti approach. Uh, I think it, it, they say 50 cases, but uh, I, to be honest, I probably took about 100, 150 patients to really feel comfortable doing an anti approach, especially if you've not been trained um, on, in your fellowship or your residency. Yeah, I think that's the kind of the key here. You know, we call it learning curve, but I think you don't get to do more complications. If you look at your whole life cycle and you buy a bunch of complications early, your complication rate is still higher overall. It can take thousands of cases to catch up from that. So, um, so again, we don't have a lot of complications in arthroplasty, so think strongly about it. And there are unique complications to each and be aware of those things. And only time and repetitions will make you good at this. That's the one thing we know in arthroplasty is that volume makes a difference. But we'll kind of wrap up with one of the questions that popped up in the question and answer. Uh, Eric, can you give us some recommendations if you're just starting between gap balancing and measured resection is one easier than the other? And before Eric answer, answers, I want to thank the COA. It was a fantastic topic and uh, probably one that we could repeat over and over again and make some serious learnings in arthroplasty and avoid any complications and help learning work. This is a, I, I want to really thank Orrin for thinking of this session. It's a great idea. I don't right. want to go over too much, but I'd say uh, if you're going to start total knees, most important is to, to do some visiting um, uh, visits with uh, surgeons and, re and really get some uh, cases under your belt with a, a trained arthroplasty surgeon. But I think measured resection in general is more intuitive to us as orthopedic surgeons since we're very familiar with bony landmarks. And I'll leave it at that.